Good evening, Brennan, to you one and all. Uh, welcome to this uh, this evening's presentation, uh, the third presentation in Series 2 of the Cranbourne Scotland History and Heritage Group, um, Histories of Our Oldest Lodges. And my early thanks to Brother Charles Winston, our Secretary, and to uh, Brother Gordon Mickey for their technical expertise in, in making this happen. Just an early reminder, Brennan, if you will, please, uh, please remain muted. Brennan, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Brother David Scott, past master of uh, uh, Glasgow Colonial Lodge number four, our presenter this evening. I'm going to look forward to his present, uh, presentation very shortly. However, on behalf of the History and Heritage Group, I extend a very warm welcome to our Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, your time and support, sir, and I know you will enjoy very much uh, this evening's presentation. So, no pressure on you, Brother David Scott, no pressure at all. Well, may I just uh, introduce the members of the History and Heritage Group, uh, most of whom I think you'll know. Uh, Brother Tom Jessup, uh, Brother Charles Winston, Brother Alistair Henderson, Brother Dr. Douglas Nicholl, Brother Gordon Mickey, uh, and our newest recruit to our numbers uh, in, the, in the group, uh, Brother Colin Arthur, a past master of Stirling Royal Arch Lodge number 76. Well, welcome to you, Brother Colin Arthur. Delight to have you in the ranks of the History and Heritage Group. Uh, and you'll be very active in this group very shortly, trust me. Um, another member is Brother Nicol Scobie. Uh, I don't see Nicol uh, uh, as yet, but uh, if he's here, welcome. If he's not, Nicol is also part of our group. Nicol being the immediate past uh, Provincial Grand Secretary in the province of Stirlingshire. Then, uh, as always, this evening's presentation will be recorded and available to, to view or review uh, tomorrow. Following uh, uh, Brother David Scott's presentation, we will have a question and answering session. Uh, and any questions, please, if you will, Brother, uh, launch them in the, in the chat box. Can I now invite uh, Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, sir, if you'd be good enough just to uh, introduce uh, our speaker this evening. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, John. Good evening, everyone. It's a, a real joy, a real pleasure uh, to see so many. We've got 76 on board tonight, which is absolutely excellent. So welcome, one and all. Our speaker this evening is Brother David Hunter Scott, Acting Secretary at the moment of Glasgow Co-Winning Lodge Number 4, and also, same time, Master of the Trades House of Glasgow Lodge 1231. David is a third generation Freemason. His maternal grandfather, William Charteris Hunter, he was a member of Lodge Moss Park, 1329. His father, Robert McAllister Scott, was a member of the Trades House of Glasgow Lodge, 1241. And of course, David is a member of both. David's mother lodge is Glasgow Co-Winning Lodge, and of course, that's what he will be talking about this evening. He was recently made proxy senior warden of Lodge Mount Faber out in Singapore. And he has, in addition to all his Masonic activity, David has quite a number of other interests. He is an ex-deacon of the incorporation of tailors in Glasgow. He's involved with the Grand Antiquities Society of Glasgow. He sits in a number of corporate and charity boards. And he's also a member of the Merchants House of Glasgow. But tonight, of course, he's concentrating on number four. So without any further ado, I would ask you all to give a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Brother David Hunter Scott. Thank you, sir, for that uh, presentation uh, and introduction on Brother uh, David. Um, can I also uh, add the, uh, warm, uh, the warm wishes of Lady Caroline who knows that you're speaking tonight, David, and has uh, asked me to, to say to you, just get on with it and do well. So, you know, she's a bit abrupt at times, but uh, she wishes you well, David, and I'm, and I'm sure we can look forward to a, 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 an excellent presentation this evening. Uh, just one final wee reminder, Brian, if you would again, uh, just please uh, remain muted. Uh, Brother David Scott, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Can I just check that you can actually see the... Yeah. Yes. The screen. Oh. 
clicked, clicked a wee bit too soon. Uh, well, thank you, Chairman, and thank you especially to, to Lady Caroline. That's, uh, that's, that's a great boost for the start of the evening. Uh, and thank you to the committee. Uh, most worshipful Grand Master Mason, venerable and distinguished brethren, brethren all, good evening. According to Professor Irene Mabor of Glasgow University, the great and the good in early 18th century Glasgow were entrenched in bitter political and religious conflict, almost certainly because the revolution settlement of 1688 to 90 had radically reoriented the prevailing power structure within the city. We are told that the accession of William and Mary as joint monarchs and the legitimization of Presbyterianism as the established faith within the Church of Scotland engendered considerable popular support in Glasgow and that the progressive image of the merchant city was fixed from that time because constitutional change was inextricably identified with modernity, liberty and the spirit of enterprise. Now, for clarity, brethren, the term merchant city in this context was a descriptor for the whole of Glasgow and not just the part of it that we know today as such. In the year of our lodge being first constituted, we were not yet the second city of empire. Indeed, we were only just the second city of Scotland. Our population of approximately 15,000 being roughly half that of Edinburgh's. So for context, that made the Glasgow then similar in size to Troon, Linlithgow or Fraserborough today. The map that you can see here was drafted approximately 15 years later with a fair bit of population growth. We were now somewhere between 18 and 20,000. But to give you an impression of scale, the circled village top left is Partick. So still very small by 21st century comparison. Nevertheless, Glasgow owned 67 ships, many of whose captains can be found in our first minute book and already had a global reputation for trade, notwithstanding competition with Liverpool was fierce and all of our trade was beset with the politics engendered by aggressive rivalries between European nations competing to exploit both the African continent and the Americas. Now, add in the last half century or so of Jacobite uprisings in the wars of British succession, and it was certainly a city where you would have been living in the most interesting of times. So the socio-economic environment in which Glasgow Co-winning Lodge was constituted on the 1st of April 1735 was rather a turbulent one, and the same continued throughout the remainder of the 18th century. And as a native Glaswegian, you may forgive me for thinking that nothing much has ever really changed since. So this slide shows our first minute, and frankly, brethren, it is worthy of a presentation on its own. I would ask you to note that although this has been celebrated for centuries as our first minute, there is no obvious indication that this was, in fact, our first meeting. Indeed, I would suggest that the practice nature of events described would indicate otherwise. And of course, from a purely technical point of view, and speaking as our Lodge Acting Secretary, I am green with envy that such a rich description of that evening's events could have been captured on a single page. There are some key elements I would like to draw your attention to. The first is our obvious connection with Canongate co-winning. Now, this connection appears time and time again throughout our history, and there are clearly some historical parallels which merit further investigation to explore the Masonic connections between Scotland's two largest cities. For example, we know that the Glasgow Linen Society predated Lord Milton's founding of what became the British Linen Bank in Edinburgh in 1745. And we know that members of the Glasgow Society were members of GKL4. It is hard to credit that Lord Milton would not have been a member of one of Edinburgh's established lodges at that time, not least as his house was in the Canongate. And it is all but inconceivable that he would not have been closely involved with prominent members of the linen trade throughout Scotland, including within our lodge. And indeed, I strongly suspect that the linen trade will provide the connection between Rabbi Burns' flax dresser and the linen merchants of both of our lodges some 30 years or so further on. 
note the use of the title, the right worshipful John Anderson, very much English constitution style and not an honorific which we practice in Scotland today. Note that the Lodge was already working three degrees. Note also that we were already following constitutional procedure. And, and remember, brethren, that we did predate Grand Lodge, so it is unclear whether this was something we had developed ourselves or which we had adopted from elsewhere. But if I was a betting man, I would wager that we were already very familiar with Dr. James Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons, published in 1723, but more of that later. Note the indication of a ceremony of installed master, or at least the beginnings of such. Although this is clearly an abbreviated minute, there is enough in it to suggest that what we were witnessing here was the Duke of Wharton's installation ritual as described in the Anderson Constitution. That Wharton was a noted Jacobite rather shortens the odds on this being the case for our lodge at least. And finally, note that the document is signed by the wardens, the installing master and the master. There is no signature from the secretary, nor indeed any mention of him in the minute itself, our secretary in 1735 being brother William Robb. Now, brethren, you cannot tell from the minute itself, but I can tell you that not one of these men was an operative mason. They were all speculative. If this was indeed our inaugural meeting, then it was historic in Masonic terms, not just Glasgow co-winning terms. Whilst we know that the first speculative Freemasons were admitted to the Lodge of Edinburgh Mary's Chapel in 1634, and we know that by the early 1700s, there were a great many mixed operative and speculative lodges in existence. I have been unable to find conclusive evidence of any wholly speculative lodge being constituted as such prior to the formation of Glasgow Co-winning. I do like to think, therefore, that we were the first, but as in all things involving Masonic history, I'm perfectly prepared to be corrected if any brother can show differently. I made mention there of the linen connection created by those linen merchants who were members of our lodge. Now, there are many historical notes concerning GKL4, which make great play of the tobacco barons, and I will touch on that later. But in terms of the economic drivers for Glasgow in the early 18th century, linen was the one which both created the greatest levels of employment and which most obviously bridged the class divides. So understand Understanding that the linen trade strongly connected Irvine and Glasgow, we should now look to how Scottish geography has helped shape our history. Remember, brethren, we are in a time of no electricity, no railways, and no go absolutely anywhere we want civil engineering. So our civic connections were almost exclusively determined by the distance in which you could travel in a single day with a horse and carriage, as determined by the local topography. Now, Irvine was still, at this time, the main seaport for Glasgow. The vast majority of Glasgow's produce was sent from there on ships, which we owned. And when I say we, I do mean mostly members of Glasgow Co-Winning. And every barrel, crate or container which was sent by the city's merchants was stamped with the number four. I will come back to that in a bit as well. So let us have another look at our map of the 1750s and see how the topography affected our intentions. Now, the first thing any military trained logistician will look for on a map is the disposition of the rivers, because rivers are hard to cross. Irvine is significant, not just because its coastal location made it easy for sailing ships to get to and from, irrespective of whether they were transatlantic or continental or coastal trade ships. It is also significant because it requires the least amount of river crossings to get goods out of Glasgow to the ships and back again. In fact, there are only three crossings. The first we know today as the Victoria Bridge, which is a two minute walk from our lodge at the Trades Hall. Now back in 1735, it would have been known as either the Glasgow Bridge or the Bishop's Bridge, depending on which side of the river you were attempting to cross from. The second was a bridge across the white car at Pollock Shaws, close to where Pollock Shaws West Railway Station is today. And then we have 20 miles of open countryside, 
travelling through Stewarton and past Kilmarnock on what is now the B769 or Old Glasgow Road and what then was the post road until we get to our destination, Irvine, which you can see on this map via the third bridge across the Annick Water at Pearston. And here you can see that the route which has Glasgow at its north end has the Glasgow Veno at its south end. Glasgow Veno, of course, being where Robert Burns and his partner Samuel Peacock established their heckling shop. And I should now like to quote directly from a letter penned by Robert Burns about this shop because it is Masonically significant. And I quote, My 23rd year was to me an important era, partly through whim and partly that I wished to set about doing something in life, I joined with a flax dresser in a neighbouring town to learn his trade and to carry on the business of manufacturing and retailing flax. This turned out a sadly unlucky affair. My partner was a scoundrel of the first water who made money by the mystery of thieving. And to finish the whole, while we were giving a welcome carousal to the new year, our shop, by the drunken carelessness of my partner's wife, took fire and was burnt to ashes and left me like a true poet, not worth sixpence. Now, the reason I describe that as Masonically significant, brethren, is because the letter was written to Dr. John Moore, a very prominent 18th century member of Glasgow Co-Winning Lodge, having become a member through our amalgamation with Johnson Co-Winning in 1753. Dr. John Moore was the father of Lieutenant General Sir John Moore, the hero of Karuna, and significantly for this part of our lecture, the son of the Reverend Charles Moore of Rowallan, the Rowallan lands then occupying most of the 20 miles of open countryside, which I described earlier on our journey between Pearson and Pollock Shaws. Moore, of course, was not the only Glasgow co-winning member of significance in the story of Robert Burns. The slide you see here lists the 19 brethren from our lodge who subscribed to the Edinburgh edition in 1787. Now, unfortunately, our minute books from this period of history are missing, presumed destroyed, so we will never know for sure whether Burns visited a lodge meeting but we can be very sure that he was socially acquainted with members of the Lodge and almost certainly attended its various celebrations at the Black Bull Inn in Argyle Street at the Westport when he, dis when he resided there in 1787 and 1788. And it was from here that he engaged in correspondence with Mrs. Agnes McElhose. They are signing their letters as Sylvander and Clarinda respectively. Now, Sometime after Burns, admittedly, but on the slide beside the drawing of the Black Bull, you can see a diary report of a Glasgow co-winning annual festival, which was held there in 1842. And that report, brethren, is actually a visit report submitted to a Masonic publication by a visitor from Canongate co-winning number two, underlining the fact that our two lodges have a deeply intertwined history, not least through the acquaintance of our national bard. However, Burns was not, in my opinion, the most important visitor to our lodge in terms of global history. Going back to our earliest records, I would argue that description belongs to another Ayrshire man, William Boyd, the fourth Earl of Kilmarnock, Grand Master Mason, 1742 and 1743. He was well known to Glasgow co-winning and his signature first appears in our minute book in August 1735. I have not yet researched too deeply, but I do note that two members of our lodge uh, listed firstly in 1735 and then in 1736 were William Crawford and James Crawford. And although Dean Castle, the seat of the Earls of Kilmarnock, was destroyed by fire in 1735, its proximity to Crawford and Castle, and indeed of both, to the earlier mentioned Rowallan Castle, all within easy walking distance of each other, suggests an overlap of fraternity, which merits further study. Kilmarnock was educated at the University of Glasgow, but he had, quote, an aversion to rigorous study of letters and was devoted to riding, fencing, dancing, and music, esteemed by men of taste 
a polite gentleman, very much the sort of chap who we continue to welcome into the lodge to this day. But as the saying goes, it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. On the 18th of August, 1746, William Boyd, his title having been declared forfeit and his estates confiscated, was beheaded at Tower Hill in London for his part in the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. And that, brethren, seems to have set in motion a chain of events running over the next half century, underpinned by what can only be described as seething anti-Hanoverian sentiment amongst some of the merchant members of our lodge, despite the rather more pragmatic Hanoverian support amongst others. However, as already mentioned, the minute book which would have proven this is missing, presumed destroyed, and we presume that it was destroyed to protect the identities of our Jacobite sympathisers and proof of any correspondence between or visits by them to colonial lodges which might carry a charge of sedition or even treason. Because the culmination of this anti-Hanoverianism was almost certainly our lodge's involvement in events leading up to and around the American Revolution and thereafter with the leaders of the French Revolution, the almost certain connection being through the tobacco <coughs> trade and other transatlantic cargoes of importance to our merchant trading brethren. Now, the evidence we have for this is purely circumstantial and is unlikely ever to be truly provable, but brethren, while the evidence stops short of being a smoking gun, it is certainly close to being a red-hot firearm. Let us consider firstly those brethren of Glasgow co-winning number four who were also members of Fredericksburg Lodge number four, the mother lodge of George Washington. Note also the shared lodge number which we will return to. There are six definite dual members and two possibles one of those definites having a long history of correspondence with George Washington. These, along with a further five brethren who were members of other lodges in that part of the Americas, and a further connection with Benjamin Franklin and his mother lodge, which I will explore in more detail, suggest a more than solid connection with those American Freemasons who would go on to become known as the founding fathers of the US of A. Regardless, you can see that we did have the strongest fraternal bonds with the oldest lodges in America, and why wouldn't we? It was, after all, our ships which were enabling the transatlantic trade that took us all there and back again, including that belonging to brother Robert Scott, a ship called the Freemason, and another belonging to shipmaster brother Robert Paisley, who is recorded in an earlier minute as having been charged to carry greetings to a lodge in Boston. Secondly, let us consider events in November and December of 1773, with which as Freemasons uh, we should all be familiar. Uh, the caption on this image by the artist John Johnson is rather delightful, brethren. It says, quote, where we met to plan the consignment of a few shiploads of tea, December 16th, 1773. Now, we cannot prove that members of GKL4 were present at St Andrew's Lodge on the exact date of the Boston Tea Party, but we do know that we had been visitors both prior and thereafter, and we know that there were ships in the harbour. To support that statement, I was told by the late and beloved brother David Selby, a past master of our lodge, that many of our members throughout the 18th century received all three degrees in a single evening. The reason being that they were about to set sail and may not return for a year or more, if at all. And an interesting note from a minute recorded in 1773 is that the master could not be installed because he was beyond the seas, although he was installed some time later. It is therefore informed guesswork, brethren, for me to suggest that ships in the harbour meant masons nautical in the local lodges, but I hope you will allow that it is highly informed guesswork. Time precludes me from going into too much detail this evening, but I'm now becoming more interested in the Annapolis Tea Party of 1774, part of the same insurgency, when the brig Peggy Stewart, containing a consignment of tea, was landed to preserve the lives of the human cargo of what were euphemistically described as indentured servants, rather than returning to London, 
which voyage would certainly have resulted in their deaths at sea. That ship, which was ceremonially destroyed by fire in that event, was part owned by brother Captain Andrew Stewart, another member of Glasgow Co-winning. With regards to the ships in Boston Harbour the previous year, we do not know how many of the ships, if indeed any at all, were owned by GKL Force sh shipmasters. The closest they've come so far is identifying brother John Rowe of St John's Lodge No. 1 as the owner of the Eleanor who was present on the night, along with another brother from America's oldest lodge, namely brother Abram Whipple. Which brings me rather nicely onto arguably the founder of American Freemasonry and possibly also at least one uh, brand of French Freemasonry, brother Benjamin Franklin, who wrote to his dear old mum and dad using the words you can see quoted at the top of this slide. Masonically though, I am rather more fascinated by his very deliberate use of the phrase fellow creatures in the second quote uh, just below, which was actually a quote contained in that same letter to his parents, Josiah and Abiah Franklin, which he wrote on the 13th of April, 1738. Brethren, fellow creatures is a GKL4 word set. Now, ever since I first heard the phrase as an anxious new laid stain standing in the West and receiving the master's charge for the very first time, I've been intrigued by my lodge's use of the wording fellow creatures rather than the far more commonly contextual fellow man. Fellow creatures actually appears four distinct times in Glasgow Co-winning Lodge ritual and across all three degrees. But I cannot recall having heard the phrase in any other lodge and so I've always assumed it to be one of our many delightful idiosyncrasies. It is only recently that I've been made aware of Brother Franklin's use of this phrase. However, having now seen various documents to which he was the signatory, I am completely satisfied that he was its originator. The first recorded usage was that letter to his parents, but perhaps the most important usage comes half a century later, providing sight of the phrase in full, and it is fellow creatures of the African race. This phrase appears in a petition which Franklin sent to the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States on the 3rd of February 1790 in his capacity as the President of the Pennsylvania Society for promoting the abolition of slavery, the relief of free Negroes unlawfully held in bondage, and the improvement of the condition of the African races. Benjamin Franklin, brethren, was a leading abolitionist. But Whilst we now know the context in which Fellow Creatures was used by Franklin, we still have no idea how it made its way into Glasgow Co-winning Lodge ritual. We know that Franklin spent many years in France, and we know that Glasgow had a mutual protection relationship with France with regards to the transatlantic tobacco trade. We know also that Franklin had a home in London and that he was particularly friendly with Dr James Anderson, the Aberdonian Freemason and Church of Scotland minister who in 1723 in London published the aforementioned the Constitutions of the Freemasons, but evidence of a direct connection between Franklin and any individual member of Glasgow Co-winning simply does not exist. On the balance of probabilities though, I would suggest that the sheer volume of anecdotal evidence concerning our Lodge's involvement with the grand affairs of state on multiple continents and our near dominance of the nautical links between all Masonically connected ports means that we must have had more than just a passing acquaintance with Franklin. I would suggest further that whatever connection there was, it was strong enough to directly influence our ritual with specific language, which has not only survived a couple of centuries worth of oral tradition, it has survived the 20th century written revisions by past masters brothers Jerry Jerdon and David Selby, and 21st century revisions from past masters, brothers Joe Reed and Norman MTM McLeod. One final piece of the admittedly still incomplete jigsaw, which I shall add before moving to our next slide, is the formation in 1833 of the Glasgow Emancipation Society by the tea merchant William Smeal and his close friend and spirit merchant John Murray, another member of Glasgow Co-winning and a member since 1824. As an aside, brethren, uh, each year when I listen to our aims and relations being read out in Open Lodge, 
I do wonder as to what caused that part of our installation process to be so necessary. I can't help thinking that GKL4, at least the 18th and 19th century versions of GKL4, must have had something to do with it, because if they weren't the cause, those brethren would certainly have struggled to comply with the strict admonition not to countenance any act which may have a tendency to subvert the peace and good order of society, to pay due obedience to the law of any state in which they resided. And the Earl of Kilmarnock has ably demonstrated the fate reserved for those who were remiss in their allegiance to the sovereign of their native land. In fact, in matters politic throughout our history, we have had 10 members serve as Lords Provost of Glasgow, and well over 50 serve as town and city councillors and bailies, including a current member serving in the current city administration. Our modern day lodge, though, having been so heavily involved in the last half century with the secretariats of both Grand Lodge and Provincial Grand Lodge, I can assure you that we are expert, determined, and most assiduous constitutional practitioners, and as we are soon to become involved with the University Lodge scheme, that is not going to be changing anytime soon. Although, as my historic secretarial forebears would almost certainly wish me to mention, we do reserve the right to be as helpful to both Provincial and Grand Lodge as we can possibly get away with. Let me, let me finish off our Jacobite and American Revolution period by a brief diversion into the founding in 1783 of the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber's own history states that, quote, the city of Glasgow prospered during the 18th century, largely due to trade with tobacco plantations in Virginia. By the 1770s, three quarters of all tobacco consumed in Europe was dealt with by the Virginia merchants in Glasgow. But American independence ended this and Glasgow's merchants decided to pool their resources and promote their interests, end quote. That indeed was the entry in the briefing notes which I and my fellow directors received on appointment to the chamber. But as I was also a member of both Trades and Merchants House and with the knowledge of our lodge associations with the founding fathers, that history just didn't sound right to me, and it still doesn't. However, brethren, life has taught me, when being presented with two seemingly contradictory versions of a single event, to ask myself, what if both versions are true? And this is where the history of the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce starts to become very interesting indeed. Now, this page is a copy of an extract from their first minute, albeit with our notations included the original version having been returned and no longer publicly available. The signature which you see at the bottom is that of Patrick Cohoon, who had just been elected chairman of the new organisation. He was also, on that date, the Lord Provost of Glasgow. His background is most interesting. 16, his relatives sent him to America, setting him up in the lucrative commercial trade in Virginia. In 1766, the 21-year-old Cahoon returned to Scotland, settling in Glasgow and going into business on his own in the linen trade. Now, from what I have told you already, you might be forgiven for thinking that I'm about to reveal Cahoon as a member of our lodge, but I can tell you, brethren, that he absolutely was not. He was not a member of any lodge. Cahoon was vehemently anti-Masonic for two reasons. Firstly, because we interfered with his trade not only by encouraging colonial rebellion, but by a rapidly emerging abolitionist position against which, according to historian Dr. Peter Linebaugh, Colquhoun employed, quote, organized political surveillance by spies and snitches of those opposing slavery, end quote. Uh, further, with regards to the ordinary working man, Colquhoun was routinely described as being a zealous advocate for keeping the people in due subjection to the powers above them. Simply, I can't think how he could possibly have been proposed, seconded or balloted for in, in a lodge such as ours. The second reason was the papal bull issued in 1738 by Pope Clement XII against Freemasonry because Colquhoun was a devout Roman Catholic. And so we can now look again at the chamber document on the left to illustrate the impact of this papal bull on Glasgow co Lodge. In 1776, with the outbreak of the American Revolution, Calhoun sided against the rebels, and along with 13 other local businessmen, 
funded a Glasgow regiment to contribute to the government's war effort. Some of these local businessmen were members of Glasgow Colwinning and they would go on with Colhoun to found the chamber. So uh, on the slide, the annotations are part of our research showing that of the 36 founder members of the Chamber of Commerce, 26 were members of our lodge, willingly voting for and committing to a noted anti-Freemason and pro-Hanoverian as their leader. It looks like quite a Masonic falling out, brethren, and it is interesting to note that an eminente apostolati specula seems to have been inspired by a Europe-wide Masonic falling out in the first place, but more research is definitely needed there. Now, I've already demonstrated how supportive of the Jacobite cause our lodge was, and I'm about to finish with an explanation of how embedded we were with the Merchants House of Glasgow. But to finish this section, I should simply say that the American Revolution was of significant trade advantage to those merchant members of our lodge who had supported the rebels and significant economic disadvantage, at least in the short term, to those who had supported the crown. Now, this view is supported by another element of the ch chamber's history, which does not quite tally with demonstrable facts, specifically their stated closeness on formation with the merchant's house from whose premises they now trade. In fact, it took the chamber almost a century to rebuild the necessary bridges with the merchants who became their landlords only in 1877. And that is almost certainly because of the grip our lodge had on that institution until then. I would like to finish my presentation, brethren, with an explanation of how our lodge arrived at its number, because we are not, in fact, numbered through any form of precedence or antiquity, nor is there any mysticism around our number. The detail on this slide, although factually accurate, is purely coincidental. Now, at this point, I wish to pay my respects to Hamilton Co-Winning Lodge number seven, and I would encourage you to visit their website to discover that there was some dispute between our two lodges as to who should have the lower number. Now, Hamilton Co-Winning Lodge are almost half a century older than we are, so were this simply a numerical issue, they would have had the stronger claim. And when lodges were being assigned their numbers by Grand Lodge, it has to be said that we gave Hamilton Co-Winning no reasonable explanation at the time other than we asked first. Now, whilst that is perfectly true, why did we ask first? Why also did Fredericksburg Lodge, with whom we were closely associated, request the number four in their constitution in 1787? Well, brethren, the number four was Glasgow's trademark, and we wished to remain associated with it. Any shipping container, whether barrel or box, which had originated from our dear green place, in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries was stamped for and any of our city's merchants in whatever part of the world they found themselves would have used that to the greatest effect in establishing their bona fides of honour and integrity. And Glasgow Co-Winning Lodge was formed by the merchants of the city, all members of the merchant's house, whose coat of arms contains the number four, as you can see here. In fact, it is the number four at the sign of the globe, which for us is where it all began. At James Henderson's, at the sign of the globe. Thank you. David, thank you. And I know I speak on behalf of all in attendance here this evening. That was truly superb. Very, very interesting and uh, I know you stopped short of saying that GKL number four actually created the world, but <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, uh, superb. And the, the, the amount of research you must have undertaken, it must have taken you some considerable time, uh, but very, very worthwhile. A most interesting talk. Um, congratulations, David. I'm sure your lords are delighted with what you've had to say here this evening. Uh, and all of us, uh, I'm sure, are delighted to have been here and witnessed such a superb presentation. Well done, sir. Thank, uh, thank, thank you very much, Chairman. I, I should say that the research, uh, on the opening slide, I did say research by the, by the Brethren of the Lodge. We have 
as a lodge, we've stayed very closely connected throughout the, the lockdown. The contributions from, from individual members have been, been amazing. Uh, Brother Joe Reid and Ian Christie uh, did so much of the early groundwork. Uh, Brother Roy Scott's uh, book, um, I mean, we've, we've lifted huge chunks from that, so, so thanks, huge thanks to, to, to Brother Roy as well. Uh, and contributions have flooded in from all over, so uh, I was... Uh, I, I merely presented the, the, the work of others, um, and it was a great pleasure to, to be able to do so. You did it superbly well, David. And now, uh, if I may, through uh, Brother Charles Winston. Um, Charles, do we have any questions that uh, we'd like to pose to, to David on his uh, wonderful uh, presentation? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Could I start, um, firstly, by thanking you very, very much, David, for a superb presentation. It's a bit like a high jump. The bar just keeps getting higher and higher. Um, you mentioned a couple of things, David. Firstly, the first speculative, uh, entirely speculative lodge. 17, December 1702, um, the lodge at Hoffoot was established. And that, that, that is well known as having been 100% entirely speculative. There were no operative masons in it. So just, just to, to raise that point. Secondly, I notice in, uh, in Draffin's uh, um, Scottish Masonic records that in 1737 the Lodge of Glasgow Kilwinning was originally given the number seven on the roll and that, that number was confirmed in I think the 1809 renumbering. It wasn't until 1816 that the number four was allocated to you. Do, do you have any comment on that? In fact number seven were originally given the number ten until they, they were renumbered. Uh, yes, they were. I found the, the, the there is a, a, a super. If I, I think it's also in the Grand Lodge um, uh, blog pages, um, the the article uh, that uh, number seven have of of their own history. Um, the clearly uh, the, the the connection is clearly with with the Merchants House, and it was clearly very very important to our brethren that we should recover the the number four. Um, there was a uh, th there were several pages of, of history that we we excised uh, to to save time, um, but the, there was all sorts of arguments over whether the Cowinning lodges should take pre precedence based on their uh, their uh, when they were chartered with Cowinning. We of course seem not to have been. Uh, I think I, I do strongly suspect we just helped ourselves to Cowinning to give ourselves a bit more credibility. Um, the um, the, but yet documents may still turn out to prove me completely incorrect in, in, in that, that, that belief. Um, but I don't think the number seven would ever have sat happily with our members uh, who were um, wandering across George Square to, to set, set up camp in the afternoon at, at the other number four. Um, I don't actually have any questions in the in the chat room, uh, Mr. Chairman. But I wonder whether David, you'd like to comment on. You mentioned that the barrels were numbered with the number four on it. Mm. Have you any further information on that? Yes. So uh, again, we we now start to see um, overlaps between the merchants and the trades, uh, and and of course the the, the coopers who, who were forming the, the barrels, which which of course were the the major shipping container, not just you know we nowadays associate barrels with uh, with uh, with, with Scotch whisky, um, the, and um, in this country at least, um, and uh, but but back then that was everything was shipped in in, in barrels in in the main, uh, and number four was Glasgow's trademark. So we would bring um, shiploads of goods across from from the Americas, uh, land uh, at Irvine trail them up to Glasgow, they would be bulk broken. Some would go into manufacturing in Glasgow, but most of it would go in smaller packages with that number four stamped on it and shipped out uh, th throughout Europe. Um, quite a bit, I suspect, straight down to French Liberia, uh, when of course there are cargoes of in indentured servants. Um, anathema to us nowadays, you know, just a, a horror story to us, to us nowadays, but, but then, um, was was seemed to be per perfectly acceptable. Um, the um, I, I'm glad I was to be able to discover dur during our, our joint research uh, that we were at, at the forefront of, of overturning that. And indeed, uh, much of the record of our, sh our ship owners and ship's captains in the uh, in the uh, 
early parts of the 19th century uh, were concerned with, with chasing down and ending the, the transatlantic slave trade, so um, some recompense at least. We do have a question from Brother uh, Grant McLeod, I think. Uh, Brother Grant, are you unmuted? Yep. Uh -huh. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, David, hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can, just can. Hi, Grant. Yeah, David, thanks very much. That, that was an excellent talk, really enjoyed it. Um, what I was going to say was, um, a wee while back I did some work um, when David Curry was doing some, uh, doing the history mm -hmm. and the, the, the sort of newsletters of the law, and yeah. it was actually relating to Johnson co-winning. Um, yes. I don't know if any further work or anything has come out of it. At that time we drew a blank. Um, I'm actually a member of the Lodge in Johnson and quite a mm -hmm. number of our members, namely the Houston family, were prominent mm -hmm. members of, uh, of well, they were Burgesses and they were also members of uh, number four. Um, and they, that, that particular family were the Lairds of Johnson and they, they started the, the Lodge, which didn't really start until 1811. So it was actually the, the, the father of um, the, the members at that time. Um, and the strange thing is, I vaguely remember that the colours of Glasgow co-winning, I think they had, was it scarlet and straw? And the, the colours of 242 are, are to this day are still, we have this, um, the, the red, so the, we've got a bit of blue in it as well. So it was, it, I'm sure there was some kind of connection and it just seemed a strange name, Johnston co-winning. Um, has any, any further light come of <laughs> anything from that? I know, I know the, the books, the minute books were lost at that time. Yeah, we've not dug too too much uh, further into it. Um, a wonderful uh, reminder of, of uh, Brother um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Dave, David Curry. Uh, we are actually in the middle of, of republishing uh, the Sign of the Globe, uh, which is a, a series of newsletters uh, researched by uh, David and, and uh, produced by uh, Brother Joe Reed and, and about to be republished very soon. Um, we've actually got an audience this evening, a Brother Archie Chalmers, almost certainly knows a whole lot more than I do uh, on on history of, of Johnson co-winning, but uh, when those papers come out, we, we are now very, very keen as a lodge to fill in the blanks from those missing minute books, so I do not have any more information uh, at the moment, um, other than to say the, the, the red and straw colouring is uh, very reminiscent of the, the city colours, uh, if you look at some of the older um, uh, crests of, of uh, Glasgow. Um, you'll see them on, on a, a red and straw coloured background. Um, so there may again be another connection there, but at the moment I have no further information, but it's certainly, uh, certainly one that's very, very high up the, on, on the to-do list. Okay, thanks David. Could I ask uh, through you Charles, uh, David, an excellent presentation. Is there any evidence of a connection with Prince Charles Edward Stuart and the Lodge. And is this perhaps a reason why some of the early minute books were destroyed because of the political implications at the Jacobite, at the time of the Jacobites? Um, well, the good news is, no, there is no evidence because the minute books have been destroyed. Um, but on the balance of probabilities, we were in it up to our necks. Um, the, and, uh, Again, if we, if we look at a lot of the, 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 the history of, of Trade's House, where, where we now reside, not, not so much the merchants and, and who was supplying the Jacobite armies and who were supplying the government armies uh, and, and of course my own incorporation, the tailors who were uh, quite happy to supply both. Uh, but that was, that was, that was uh, probably a means of survival rather than a, a means of, of profiteering. Um, but I've, I've been dragged more and more uh, into so I'm going to have to explain that. If I, if I can go back a step, most of the histories that we are researching are histories that have been written in English language. Um, now I spent a bit of time over in Spain, so if, if, if when, when I'm speaking to some of the historians and some of the university people over there, those who, who are fluent and can read French and Spanish and Italian um, actually have a much richer impression of what was happening with Freemasonry and with the Jacobite and Hanoverian schism um, the, uh, right across Europe and in, into Russia uh, around about that time. So I think what we are seeing is just um, 
I, th I think we're seeing an awful lot of effects with with the the, the 50 and the 45 uh, and, and much much more so than we're seeing absolutely all of the causes um so uh, it's it I'm, I'm afraid uh, I apologize to you all brethren I probably raised far far more questions than I provided answers and it's certainly the case that those of us who've been researching um, uh, started off being a you know let's get together for an hour and um, at the end of three hours had discovered we hadn't got to the first thing we we're going to look at in the first place we've been dragged off in so many other tangents but it just, it's a fascinating period of history and there is no doubt that um, Scottish Freemason, our Freemasonry had, um, in my opinion, um, seeing there's no doubt, in my opinion, Scottish, our, our brand of Freemasonry had a very calming effect uh, a, a, across a, across the whole of Europe, and I think uh, I think we could have seen far far more violent division uh, than than there actually was with without it. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Any other brother like to ask any questions? Can I hand back to you, Mr. Chairman? Thank you, Charles. Yes, indeed. Sorry, sorry Mr. Chairman. Andy Mushin's trying to get any questions. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Carol, sorry, I beg your pardon. I haven't unmuted myself there. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say to uh, Brother David Scott, what well, a superb, superb presentation tonight. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, Colouring uh, some of the, the the bits in in Glasgow that uh, is missing. I just wanted to ask you, David. Uh, I've heard the report that um, in 1867 there was a dinner in Glasgow where they were celebrating the 145th uh, anniversary of uh, the founding of Echo Winning Number Four, which would mean then that you were established in 1722. Do you know anything about this? Is this correct, or is this something that you're still investigating? Um, uh, yes. Um, now, this uh, this allows me to answer uh, a question. Brother David David Jack would have uh, would have asked himself if 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 we weren't practicing honor honor amongst thieves, or rather honor amongst presenters. Um, the um, so Brother David wanted to know if, if we knew which lodges our founders had come from. Uh, and, and I thank you, uh, Brother Charles Winston, for, for the information about Lodge Hallfoot. And that's, um, I, I did not know that. Thank you. You have um, you have added to my Masonic knowledge, and I'll, I'll explore that a bit more fully. But I, I, I do not think for one second that uh, we uh, formed on the, the first, 1st of April, 1735. However, uh, we must never let facts get in the way of a good story. And so that is the date that we certainly for the last century or so have, have, have accepted as a formation date. Uh, and, and I would hate to spoil everyone's diaries for our 300th anniversary, which will, will happen um, at, at some point um, <laughs> in the not too distant future. Um, but I, I do think we formed much earlier. I do not think that we formed from any other lodge. I do think it was the merchants of the, the city who decided, well, uh, those those operative Freemasons at Lodge of Glasgow St John won't let us play, so we'll just do our own thing. Um, and, and I think what we were seeing in, in, uh, in 1735 was the, um, was, was really the lodge being Given some kind of, of tacit a, approval and, and, and being recognised as as an, an actual lodge. Now, loads and loads of speculation in there on, on my part. It's not one that we've really explored too deeply. Uh, but yes, um, we, we do think the, the newspaper report that it was 145th anniversary is accurate. Um, but also, I do think our claim that we were formed in the 1st of April, 17. Um, um, 35 is accurate as well. Re remember, brethren, um, what, what if both both parts of the story are true? What would the picture look like then? Well, well thank you, Brother Scott, for sitting on the fence. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I look forward to your further report on that uh, 1722 uh, date. Thank you. Thank you. Brother John, may I ask a question, please? Magnus Burgess, number five. 
Hi, brother David. Good lecture. Very good lecture. Can I ask, what was your, what is your lodge's uh, during the Jacobite rebellion with Lodge Canongate Kilwinning number two? What was the relationship like around that time? Because when I'd done my research, uh, we had quite a few rebels in number five, hmm. but Canongate Kilwinning number two kind of did quite a, against members of number five. They kind of reported them. Uh, so what was your kind of uh, relationship with them at that time? Who's being such a, a Jacobean lodge or members being of that trait? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to uh, sit in the fence again. I'm probably going to sit in a number of, of, of fences. Uh, period in, in history, it wasn't just Jacobites and Hanoverians that were, were, were having a go. Uh, Glasgow was emerging and it was really ramping it up as a city. Transatlantic trade had become a thing. Um, the, uh, and there was lots and lots of money to be made. There was division clearly within Church of Scotland as to which brand of Protestant for me to say Protestantism, it was going to to pursue. Uh, there was there was divisions between it and and uh, Roman Catholicism. There was um, there was disputes between the Whigs and the Tories and and, and all the different brands of politics that were emerging. Uh, I then chuck in some merchants who actually were very mutually dependent uh, for or codependent for for their trade. And then. Look at institutions like um, the, the the linen societies, which became the linen bank and the the, the mutuals that, that were forming, and then look at the uh, the links between uh, gentlemen in Edinburgh and gentlemen in Glasgow, and, and Glasgow, of course, was really at that period much more of a, of a west of Scotland. So, so you know uh, the. Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, for example, when in 1771 um, started in Edinburgh, came to Glasgow, went to Inverera and, and, and back again, so, and, and then all over to Ireland. Um, so so, so the, the, the links were, were extreme, but I doubt very much if there was enough recorded or, or saved uh, for, for history in, in any of our minute books that, that would let us prove any of this. It, it, probably remains in, in the realms of um, docu, d docudrama rather than rather than, than hard fact. Yeah, because I found lo it looks like if Edinburgh was quite conservative at that mm. time, and uh, no one would kind of put their head amongst the parapet to say they were mm. kind of fair, they were more interested in their own, keeping their own wealth and whatever, than to be put their flag to anything. And it was just that you being so, then we would kind of get, uh, number two, mm -hmm. and this research I did, I just wondered if they kind of, because you were kind of being Jacobean, if they had a kind of say, that, oh, you can't keep doing mm -hmm. that, or something along these lines, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, the, there is there is a report that the uh, Milton called the, the linen bank, the British linen bank, um, because he thought that was, you know, for, for mostly for a politi political reasons to, 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 to make sure that it was allowed to. Uh, to progress, so lo lo I don't know what, lo I don't know loads what of that he's looked at. I don't want to get too much away because you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll see what I mean in next week when I bring this bit up about what happened Looking forward around that to time. It. Looking forward to okay. it. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well done. Yeah. There is a comment in the chat room that uh, the term fellow creatures is used by Lodge Muller Kill winning in their third degree. Excellent. Could I also make a comment on your use of the term worshipful brother or right worshipful in 1735? Mm. I, do, I wonder when um, Glasgow St John Bis started using that term because the term presses was very common in Scotland in the 1720s. Mm -hmm. I just wondered when uh, perhaps Glasgow, you know, um, St John number three Bis, which were very much operative, they were probably using that term. I, do, I don't know when they started using the term right worshipful. That might be something that uh, you could maybe look at. Yeah, perhaps we can we can ask uh, 
last little three minutes for a little bit of jank if we get there. Uh, not so this evening, but in the future, if you, there's a wee bit of a comment on that. Can I just thank you, David, for the manner in which you have answered very impressively all those questions and very diplomatically when you had to. <laughs> not sitting in the fence, diplomacy. Well done, sir. Um, if there are no other questions, I will now invite the Grand Master Mason. If you care to make a few final remarks. Thank you very much, John. Uh, David, could I congratulate you and your fellow researchers most sincerely uh, for a, a tremendous insight, not only into uh, the history of number four, but also uh, a history of a specific part of Glasgow as well. Uh, the shipping side of things I found tremendously interesting. So thank you for uh, that as well. Uh, as our chairman mentioned earlier on, the bar seems to be getting higher and higher and higher, and that can only be really good. Uh, this is the eighth uh, lecture in the, the, the whole series, and um, I have to say I've found them all absolutely fascinating, and tonight was absolutely no exception to that rule. So thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you all. I think we hit 76 at one point tonight, Charles, of that's... Yes, uh, that's right drop down a wee bit now, but um, it just shows that there is a tremendous interest uh, from the brethren in these lectures. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you, John, and your committee for your continuing work in making sure that we, we have a very enjoyable Wednesday night. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you again, Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, uh, for your comments and for your ongoing support. It is very much appreciated. Brethren, our next uh, presentation will be a week tonight. It will be Wednesday the 30th of October at 7pm as usual. Uh, and we will hear uh, the, uh, a presentation on the history of Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate, number five. And we'll have a joint presentation that evening by Brother Magnus Budges, who is Class Master Secretary of the Lodge and who uh, was asking some questions of Brother David Scott just a few moments ago. Uh, uh, with Brother Mike, this will be Brother Neil Wood, past master also of the Lodge. And between them, they will provide a joint presentation on number five. And we look forward to that. And I hope, Brethren, that many of you, uh, all of you, in fact, are available to join with us next Wednesday. Can I just close with uh, uh, an expressing uh, thanks of the History and Heritage Group uh, for all who have attended, uh, for your continued support, and may I also just uh, again finally thank our presenter this evening, Brother David Scott, for an excellent presentation uh, and for the manner in which he handled quite a number of questions there. Well done, sir. Thank you, Brethren. Have a safe journey home. Brethren, if, you, if you'd like to unmute for a few minutes and say your goodbyes. Well done, David. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, David. Well done. Thanks, David. Very well done. <coughs> Superb, David. Congratulations. <coughs> Most interesting and very entertaining. Thank you very much. Congratulations, David. Very interesting. Well done, David. Colin Duthie has taught you well. He <laughs> has indeed, yes. If only we'd answer his phone every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, David. Very enjoyable tonight. Thank Congratulations, you, Gary. Congratulations and thank you from Cape Town. Thank you. Thank you, David, and uh, congratulations from uh, Nippon and Labrador. Thank you, David. Thank you. Good night, brethren, and stay safe. Right. Thank you, David. Very enjoyable. Thank you, brethren. Good night. Thank Good night. you very much, Charles. Thank you. Good night, brethren. Well, well done, David. Thank you. Well done, David. Oh, Good night, David. I knew you were the correct choice, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you owe me, Master. <laughs> <laughs> As always. <laughs> Thanks, David. I really enjoyed that. Oh, hi, David. Good night, David. Good night, all. Good night, guys. David. Good night. That was excellent. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Good night, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Well done, David. Well done, David. That was excellent.
Thank you. I am I am going to have to go, gents. That's um, a, a, a wee a wee dram and a big dinner. I, I wait. <laughs> quite right. Quite we'll right. see. We'll see well you all done. next week. Well done, David. Well done, Tom. Bye then.